from Wondery. This is Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. I'm your host, David Reinstrom. What's your secret? My secret is that I was born in a barn. I got to talk to Dave Holstein and Alan Schmuckler, two of the creative minds behind Wait, Wait, Don't Kill Me, our vibrant and biting musical satire of the true crime genre. Alan wrote the music and lyrics, and Dave wrote the book. Dave and Alan have been working together for a long time and had exciting and varied creative careers. Dave has worked on Weeds, Raising Hope, and HBO's The Brink. Alan has worked on musical adaptations of The Emperor's New Clothes and Diary of a Wimpy Kid. He's been nominated for the Jeff Awards in Chicago, and he's been a writer-in-residence at the Johnny Mercer Foundation Songwriters Project. These are some talented dudes, and they're smart, too. We talked about the origins of the show, the difficulty of satirizing something sensitive, and the difference between satire and parody. Take a listen. How did the two of you meet? Alan, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, sure. This, uh, this is Alan. We met, um, we both graduated from uh, Northwestern University in 2005. Um, so we met writing for uh, Northwestern's Wam Yu show. Uh, the, uh, it's an annual entirely student-written musical that's faculty produced and faculty directed um, that's going on... Oh man, it was around 75 years when we graduated, so the, it, it's got to be, it's close to 80, 85, 86 by now. Um, yeah, I think it was actually the cause of World War I, the show. So that was <laughs> how many years ago? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's been, it's been around for a while. It's, it's an amazing Northwestern tradition that a, a lot of, um, professional writers and actors and, uh, directors and, uh, and a lot of folks in the performing arts have, uh, have, uh, come out of, um, and, uh, Dave and I were both writers for, uh, for the WAMU show. So we met, we met collaborating, uh, when we were in school. So let's go back to the, the germ of Wait, Wait, Don't Kill Me. Uh, obviously you were inspired to make it by the serial podcast, yes. but at what, what point was it that you decided you wanted to take this media phenomenon and re-express it as a piece of musical theater. Sure. Uh, th- this is Alan still. The The very beginning of the idea came from its uh, the show's original incarnation um, as part of um, uh, a late night series at the Flea Theater uh, in downtown Manhattan um, called Serials, mm-hmm. um, apropos enough, Serials at the Flea. Um, and the way Serials works, um, it's a late night series. Um, you show up, uh, tickets are cheap, you get a beer, um, and every week five playwrights, or in our unusual case, uh, musical theater writers, um, usually it's plays, every so often they do a musical, um, they premiere uh, five, I believe, 15 to tw- 10 to 15, maybe 20, 15, whatever, 10 to 15 minute uh, short plays, or in our case, musicals. Um, the audience over the course of the weekend votes on their favorite, um, and the top three uh, per, uh, shows, performances, um, the following episode gets written for the following week. So it's, it's serialized oh, cool. theater. Um, it's really cool. It's, um, the, the folks, uh, down at the flea, um, Dave and I consider ourselves very lucky to have been a part of that world for a little bit because the, um, the, uh, the ensemble of actors there, the bats are like really like incredible talent and ta- incredibly talented. Um, and, um, what they are able to conjure out of, I mean, absolutely thin air over the course of a number of days, because I mean, you know, the the a show gets written in days, in absolute days. You know, it gets written, it gets rehearsed, it gets thrown together, and it gets put up. Um, and it's 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 very inspiring. So my um, uh, one of my other oldest and best friends, uh, along with Dave, um, is a guy named Kevin Labson who's a director in New York, who's the former artistic director of the People's Improv Theater. He has a, a real uh, improv and sketch background um, and experimental downtown theater background. Um, Kevin had been directing uh, for serials at the Flea uh, on and off for a while. Um, and since I had moved to New York a few years prior, um, had been trying to get me to come see it. Um, and the shows uh, are like at 1130 at night, and I was curmudgeonly and did not want to go out that late until finally one day, <laughs> um, uh, uh, honestly, God, I was like, that's so late, it's downtown. I, I, was, I, was, I was catching about it. So finally, um, this was November of 2014, so Serial had just begun, and the kind of uh, uh, phenomenon of it was kind of in, in its full swing, or beginning to ramp up, up into its full swing, um, and I finally bit the bullet, and I said, I'll, I'll come down and I'll see a show, I'll see, I'll see serials, um, and I saw it, and I was absolutely bowled over, um, and blown away, uh, I had such a good time, I was so inspired, um, and uh, as Kevin and I started talking afterwards, we were talking about you know, what would a musical of this be? A musical thing, what would that be? And so we chewed over the idea of um, 
a, a musical for serials based on serial. There was something that seemed oh. kind of twisted in its kind of in in the kind of like straightforwardness of that idea. That was kind of part one, and then the important part two or one A is that at the same time, Dave. Um, happened to be in New York. This was, again, end of November. This was literally uh, about two years ago, almost to the day. Dave and I started talking about this idea. And and as a tribute to Dave's brilliance, um, I can boast about Dave even if, even if he is too humble to, I said to Dave, you know, there's this thing of musical serials, serial musical about serial, and Dave, like, immediately pitches out to me an entire arc about Sarah Koenig and Ira Glass and, like, murder and revenge and suspicion and um, and, um, and the kind of dark role of the media and sensationalism, and, um, he kind of, he starts spinning out a story for me that, I mean, I, rem I remember sitting, like, in traffic driving up to Connecticut and being like, well, I mean, obviously, this idea is ours, yours, and mine, and we, we're, we need to, we need to do this. So, we I began... I remember that very clearly. <laughs> yeah, very clearly. It was, um... It was, um, there was something that spoke to us both about it, uh, both in terms of the kind of, um, lunacy of it, um, and mm -hmm. also the darkness of it, the, um, touchiness of it, the, um, the potential offensiveness of it, but we, we were very clear very early on that we did not want to make, like, a zany parody of serial that felt offensive to both of us and that felt offensive in the way we didn't want to lean into that felt kind of tasteless to the both of us but what was interesting to both of us was to tell a story that was comically shocking in its premise and that also tried to be a little um darker and more rigorous in terms of um its um it's indictment of the podcast and of, of the of the sensationalism of so much of what I think we're consuming as a media culture and have been since Serial came out. Serial and Make sure. a Murderer um, and uh, and uh, the, uh, what is it, the, is it the... The Jinx. The Jinx? Yeah. The Jinx and the list goes on and on. Dave, let me, let me rope you in here. Yeah, sure. Um, how did you, how did you build that rigor into the book? Well, you know, how did I think you what's... walk that tightrope? Uh, brilliantly. Um, no, I, <laughs> I, uh, I remember we actually started writing this, David, uh, while Serial Season 1 was still airing. So keep in mind, while, while this idea was, was gestating, the first, I think, couple episodes of Serial were out and there were still others airing. So we were going up at the flea while this was all super, super fresh. Um, and uh, which which was very exciting to be able to sort of have to come up with this thing on the fly and thread that needle at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, quite how to answer your question other than just the sense that there is a delicate tightrope to walk between parody and satire. And usually if your characters are charming and empathetic and have grounded goals, even if they're absurd, um, you can hook an audience in enough to walk that tightrope with you. Um, but it is a tricky one. You know, I, I, I think uh, um, it's a challenge that I really enjoy, and, I, and I've always tried to seek out the same sort of tightrope in uh, my television work as well, and, and find shows that sort of uh, walk that line between drama and comedy and uh, uh, offensive and satirical and, and yeah, it, it really, uh, it's a challenge I like to attempt. I want, I want to dive into how you walked the line between offensive and absurd, because you wanted to fall always on the absurd side rather than the offensive side. Well, I think that's the nature of farce, you know, is to exaggerate something so far beyond reality that it can't be misinterpreted as anything but ridiculous. You know, I think when you first meet Ira Glass, somebody who I certainly love and who I've uh, listened to for years, um, he's mm -hmm. like the nicest, kindest, you know, man. And so we kind of were like, well, let's make him, uh, you know, kind of a megalomaniac because if you know Ira Glass, you know, you know that's just such a ridiculous interpretation of him that I, I hope it softens you know, the blow for what's to come. You know, I, I think that if you can 
treat uh, the sort of public figures you already know and needle them a little bit and and play with them, play with expectation and subvert them, then when you're dealing with the real emotional core of the reality of the thing, of the murder of a real person and the incarceration of a real person, that those people you don't have the same leeway with because you want to you know, go the other way with it, which is you want to give them more truth than what you heard in the Serial podcast. You want to give them more humanity. You know, you want to um, go the other way. And I think it's that's the, the balance. You know, as you go more absurd with the people you can go absurd with. But then at the same time, you have to give, you know, uh, their love story, uh, Hey Adon's love story, more credence than the uh, Serial podcast gave it, I think, for that reason. And I don't want to anticipate, but I, I will say that 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 you know there is something that is sort of definitively difficult about satirizing something. And you know we have a song um, called "I Could Listen to That" that uh, yeah. sort of opens up uh, Act Two and uh, Part Four of the podcast, um, and it's a song about uh, how true crime is sort of built on exploiting victims. And right. we take that song to an exaggerated place where I, you know, hope it's clear we're making a satirical point. Now, the issue with, you know, satirical uh, elements in general is, you know, think of All in the Family. Think of uh, Archie Bunker, right? If you hear one of Archie Bunker's racist rants, right, out of context, it's super duper offensive, Right. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, he's dropping the N word and the F word. And yet, if you hear that in the context of the show, it's satirizing our racist culture. And so I think the trust you have to give to an audience is that they'll understand that. And that's not always the case. Um, and I think that's the challenge with satire in general is is sort of hoping that is knowing that you kind of have to uh, cross a line to show people the deeper meaning, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. with if you're just gonna par you know, parody something, I think it's a little easier. I think you can just make fun of something and call it a day, but... Yeah, what, how do you define the difference between parody and satire? Well, I think parody is spoof. You know, parody is making fun of something for its flaws. You know, it's um, SNL. You know, it's doing a sketch where you are uh making fun of the thing i think with satire you're trying to go after the bigger picture you're trying to use irony and exaggeration and you're trying to hold a mirror back up to the audience and say man isn't it twisted you're laughing at that you know and what does that say about mm -hmm. you what does that say about the, you know, um, what does it say about us? I mean, I think there are elements of both in, in the show at different places, but I think the, the, mm -hmm. the general, um, you know, goal of a musical, especially one about uh, real people, you know, uh, or any, any uh, attempt at art or, or fiction or whatnot is, you know, if you're, if you're just going to make fun of a dead person, I mean, get the hell out. <laughs> like, like, that's not right. like, why would you go, go after that, go after that exercise? I think that, you know, the, 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 the darker road and the harder road that, that we chose to take was to, you know, do a show that is funny and that makes you laugh. And then at the end of the show, we remind you what you're laughing about. And I think that's, you know, that's something I'd rather spend my time doing than just, uh, you know, um, making fun of something for what it did wrong. We'll be right back with more from my interview with Dave Holstein and Alan Schmuckler. When you were when you were working on the show, when when, when you were initially listening to Serial, um, to what extent did you participate in like Serial Reddit conspiracy theories and wild mass guessing? I, I think there is something you know, David, to uh, the Reddit of it all, especially if you if you've uh, watched other true crime uh, shows like uh, Making a Murder and The Jinx, 
there's something really inspiring at, at the sort of levels of conspiracy you'll find in these threads. Um, and I, I think in a lot of ways, our show is one of those really insane Reddit threats. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> correct, we correct. basically take that conspiracy and up it to an exponential value. You know, I mean, it, we take it to insane places. And I think that's um, where a lot of that came from was this, uh, and correct. you know, the, 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 these Reddit, uh, these Redditors who, uh, uh, really give a creative way through a murder, you know, and things you could never anticipate. And I think my goal was to top that and try to try to see that maybe, you know, maybe the uh, the uh, the one thing they didn't think about is, you know, what if Sarah Koenig did it, you know, and then treat that totally deadpan and then go with it and see where it went and let it let it get more insane. What what Dave? What is the thing that attracts? attracts you, attracts people in general to the genre of true crime? What makes it so watchable, so listenable? I think it's that reality TV uh, hormone, you know, that that dopamine of not only is this crazy, but it's real. Um, I think, and, and also, frankly, the, uh, the serialization um, of... Uh, the sort of episodic nature of the twists and turns of that story, I think, give a lot of plot momentum uh, to those uh, uh, to those pieces. Um, I know, you know, making a murderer. It's all about the cliffhanger, and same thing with the uh, the OJ uh, trial in FX. And you know, they're they're so good at that. And I, I think that that's the. Uh, um, it's also why, you know, when we wrote this show, we divided it into five parts was to really give it a sense of cliffhanger, uh, of Netflix-esque plot momentum and why I think it works um, so well as a podcast. Yeah, it's a, it's a binge. It's a binge, yeah. Um, I, I would add to that, I think, I don't know, it seems to me that what is compelling about True crime and reality TV by extension, but the the most salacious you know subgenre of reality TV, which is this true this true crime genre, mm -hmm. is that there's an experience when you're taking it in of it's so real it actually happened, and I can't believe it. No, not I can't believe it didn't happen to me, but I'm so glad in my darkest moments that that's not me. Um, when it's fiction, you're let off the you know, even the most compelling fiction, you're let off the hook of, well, it's not real. It's never happened to anybody to see and to hear about these horrible things. Um, but it's not you. I, I, I think in my, in my darker moments, that is, that's probably what yeah, bubbles yeah, up. Yeah. And that's what we, that's what we've tried to, that's what we've tried to infuse into this show too, that feeling of, and there's, there's, um, there's a lyric about it too. And that I could listen to that song, um, that speaks to it. The, the feeling of, well, it's, um, it's not me, you know, uh, and it's it's unsettling, and I think it's what it's part of what makes the genre so compelling. How have you both been playing with the form of musical theater in your work? You know, I I, I can speak for myself, and then I want to hear Alan say this because I hmm. I'm not someone who loves traditional musicals, and I think Alan does. I and do, I, yeah. And I think that um, it's always been that uh, conversation that has made me come back to work with Alan again and again and again, um, which is to find a, a new way to say something in a way we've heard before, <laughs> you know? Um, the uh, the first musical that we did together was um, uh, an adaptation of The Emperor's New Clothes for Chicago Shakespeare. And we had seen a lot of shows written for children um, about fairy tales. And we both adamantly did not want to create another disposable Hans Christian Andersen musical. So what we did is we took a page from Pixar and we wrote a show that I think generally aimed to work on both eyelines, you know, for adults and kids and to explore uh, deeper and darker themes than I think you might expect in a show about the emperor's new clothes. And um, I had such a good time with that show, and, and the show got some great reviews, and, and it, it uh, went up for the, the summer in Chicago, and it was a wonderful production. And I think it just made me realize that 
what's great about um, that, that, that there is something, how do I say this? There is something in that musicals can do that no other form can. I'm, I'm curious to know, speaking of production, what are, what are some things that a podcast musical can do that a staged musical cannot do? Oh, uh, well, this is Alan. Let me, let me jump in and start. Um, strictly on a, from a musical standpoint, one of the things that as we are producing these episodes is so thrilling as is this musical can sound like literally anything. Now, of course, there are restraints of time and of resources and of what is necessary to the story, because when there are no boundaries at all, when it can be literally anything, then it's kind of nothing. Um, so it has sure. to tell... My job is to tell Dave's story, a story that Dave and I crafted together, but Dave, Dave is really the, the mastermind behind the, the craft of the journey that these characters go on and the tone. So my job is to serve him and to serve that story and to serve the, the clarity and, um, and uh, compelling nature of these characters and their relationships and how they change. Um, but to that end, if I'm producing this live, um, there are always, um, you know, tremendous exigencies of number of instruments, of um, scope, whereas when the only limit is my auditory imagination, um, where I'm scoring this for like the equivalent of like a 60 piece orchestra, you know, and a rock band and a gospel choir and like, and um, a beats producer. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give, what excites me about it is uh, the music can really tell story in a very rigorous, ranging, um, uh, hopefully creative way. Um, that's true of the music. That's true of the sonic world. Um, it's kind of like creating a movie that no one sees. Um, Steven, uh, our, uh, our engineer extraordinaire, um, has been taking the lead on creating all the foley in the world of the show. So every footstep and every background noise, and there have been lengthy conversations about like the particular types of doorbell we're using and the types of doors and, and what kind of shoes people wear stuff. That's, I mean, you know, crazy in its minutia, but that hopefully adds up to a very full and compelling world, um, that has, the again the emotional accessibility and um rigorousness and um uh and depth hopefully and and humor of a musical and the um and the kind of high def reality of uh, a film just one you you can't see so let's talk about the cast um sure. my my buddy jeffrey is a director and um he describes working with actors that he's known for a really long time as opposed to actors he's just met um, as being like sitting down to work with like freshly sharpened pencils instead of working with crayons. Um, would you agree with that characterization? Depends how he feels about crayons. Um. <laughs> yeah, crayons can be lovely. There are all those colors and, you know, there's yeah. something very immediate about a crayon. There is something very empowering about working with collaborators of any stripe, be they actor or writer or director, um, with whom you have had positive experiences in the past and with mm -hmm. whom and whom you have seen you've seen them uh, execute your material well and with um a sense of um their own personal resonance you see that they they pick up what you're throwing down and they dig it and they add to it they 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 make it more than it is they teach you about what you're doing um yeah and so I think in, in that respect, the, uh, the the pencil crayon analogy is is accurate. Um, uh, we've worked uh, – Dave and I have now worked with Jesse Canizzaro um, a couple of times in various incarnations of Wait, Wait, Don't Kill Me and in um, Red, Green Coat. Jesse is a tremendously prodigious, like, comic actress um, who is very unique. There is n I, no one like her. Um, and um, – she she gets it and uh, we, we appreciate we appreciate what she does. Um, I, I I think I, I can't speak for her, but I, I I think she appreciates what we do. Um, and so coming back to work on especially a character like the version of Ira Glass that we've we've kind of conjured up in this. It's it's such a specific needle to thread, and Jesse is Jesse is both the thread and the needle. So it it does. Um, there's a there's a shorthand and a joy there that uh, we we don't we don't take for granted. It takes a certain level of talent to come into play Ira Glass as a 90 pound female, mm -hmm. and continue to come back and play that part because you have staked uh, ownership over it. <laughs> she um, 
uh, truly bring something original to it. And, uh, you know, I think like other actors we've worked with, um, before you, you develop a shorthand and, and that shorthand is, uh, priceless. What's your writing process like for the two of you? When you sit down to break a play, how does it, how does it work? When do you know when a song should bubble up? Oh, that's interesting. The way we crafted, um, at least started with this was every episode, Dave and I talked about what could happen next, what should happen next. Dave always takes the lead um, in terms of story crafting, developing, you know, fleshing out what happens. Um, Dave would write um, essentially um, a one page or less treatment of everything that happens in pure bare bones terms in a given episode. Uh, this Sarah goes here. She talks to Adnan who says this Adnan and Hay have this thing happen. Ira glass, et cetera. Um, with, with these characters, which is again, part of the, the crazy, the crazy and slightly uh, dangerous fun of it. Um, Dave builds a story. Um, I take the story and I essentially try to grab as much of as uh, much of it as I can and put it into music. Um, in episode one, uh, I think about like eighty five percent of it is sung through. Um, over the course of the rest of the episodes, the balance kind of moves a little bit more towards fifty fifty. Um, my goal is always to tell the story as you know, in the most straightforward way as possible. Get from moment to moment, um, and in doing so. Songs reveal themselves and moments for dialogue reveal themselves. Uh, Dave, let me let me ask you, what 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 is your intuition for whether or not a scene, whether or not a, like a given run of dialogue should be a run of dialogue or should be sung through? You know, I usually leave that up to Alan in the sense that what I like to do is overwrite the dialogue and then I give free license to Alan to make anything that needs to be sung, sung. And as Alan has uh, taught me over the years, you know, the, the reason a song exists is because the uh, c character, the actor needs to express that thing in song. It is so emotional. It is so whatever. It, it, it defies words and dialogue. It needs to be sung. And so I'm always happy to write a, uh, a, a contentious scene or an argument or a, a love scene and, and let him decide where... Uh, the emotions need to be scored in that scene. And if they're uh, a song, they become a song. What? So to, to close us out, what genres do you want to explore in musical theater that you haven't done yet? We never really aim our sights on genre, but we certainly aim our sights on things we haven't seen in musical theater before. Um, we have a, a couple shows in the in the works that were sort of, you know, wading through the moment that, uh, are weird and fun and different. Uh, <laughs> and I think that, uh, I, I always hope that that's their strength, you know, to, to be the thing that scares the person you're pitching it to. Um, I, I hope that's true. I, I, I feel like if everybody loves what you're doing, you're not making strong enough choices. Um, and, uh, to that end, we have lots of things people are going to hate, uh, <laughs> but, um, we, uh, gosh, um, you know, uh, I have been dying to write my musical titled and Frankenstein, um, oh, that, no. uh, you know, <laughs> oh no, oh no, oh no, oh, no. <laughs> I know, see, it's hard. People just assume the worst, you know? You know, I, I think if I can get that reaction, David, from, <laughs> from anybody, at least I know they haven't heard it before. Um, sure. And, uh, no, that's fabulous. you know, and I, I think something that we, we thrive on is execution to uh, execution in the face of assumption, you know, which is, okay. uh, I would a hundred percent agree, you know, is that if you can bring something around and someone says, wait a second, like you want to do a hip hop musical about the founding fathers where they're all ethnic minorities and you've chosen the first treasury secretary as your protagonist. Yeah, good freaking luck with that. I think a lot of great story ideas can't be pitched or given a trailer to or defined by a song that is cut out from the middle of the show and played for everyone to hear. I, I think that, you know, there's there's a uh you know, there's a there's a certain fear that grips every writer that they have to make everything uh, an elevator pitch and they have to make everything traditional and digestible and they don't want to scare people. And, and I think that I would never be happy as a writer knowing that I'm selling things that people, um, 
that that sound sellable. You know, I think it's my job to give you something that sounds like something you've never heard before and sounds something sounds, sounds like something kind of unsellable and then work very hard to execute it in a way that made you forget why you doubted it. Hmm. Um, Fabulous. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Type today. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> I really uh, appreciate it. Of course, it. of course. Ah, thank you for uh, your gravelly voice. It, uh, <laughs> it just makes me want to listen to more of uh, this podcast and, uh, and others. Good. You should hear my, uh, my mid-70s Tom Waits bar fly. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks for having us. What a pleasure it was to talk to Alan Schmuckler and Dave Holstein. I hope you had the same kind of fun as me. And if you did, let us know. We're talking about the show on Twitter using the hashtag WWDKM. And send us your love on the iTunes store. We're aiming for 500 five-star reviews. And when we get there, it's swag time, baby. We're opening a shop just for you. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe the art panel on your podcast application to reveal our show notes and sponsors. When you buy a subscription box or underpants or a mattress using our subscription codes, you benefit the continued production of this show. So, thank you. Coming up soon is a special holiday episode called The Gift of Listening, featuring all your favorite voices from Wondery's podcast network and hosted by me. That's next week, just in time for the winter holidays. Hanukkah, Kwanzaa and Christmas all align perfectly this year. So, Chag Sameach, Joyous Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas, and Happy Winter Solstice to all y'all. Thank you for listening to Secrets, Crimes, and Audio Tape. The theme song for our series was composed by Mark Hatley. Our executive producers are Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Until next time, I'm your host, David Reinstrom. What's your secret? Ooh,